Good morning. Good morning. What a great crowd on a Friday morning in Washington, D.C. Uh, I'm Dr. Sophie Ali. I'm chairman of the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center, and it is a distinct honor to welcome all of you today uh, for our uh, annual conference, which I believe is a stellar conference. Uh, we had to wait a little bit. We normally start on time, but we had to wait for certain uh, uh, delays that were unavoidable with the Washington, D.C. traffic. Uh, I have some opening remarks before our uh, uh, keynote speaker, who is here. Uh, in the past year, Palestinians and Israelis have awaited the unveiling of Jared Kushner's deal of the century. In Arabic, it's called Safqat al-Qarn. Some of us call it Safat al-Qarn. Uh, it remains to be defined. Uh, we can be certain that it will fail to satisfy the just and reasonable demands of the Palestinian people. Uh, we are at a historic moment and a historic crossroads as Palestinians as well as the entire people of the Middle East. Uh, I just returned about five days ago from Jordan and uh, I think that I have a uh, feeling of the pulse in the, in the area. This is a time of unforeseen crises to Palestinian rights and sovereignty that were unimaginable 10 years ago, maybe even five years ago. Uh, it's a situation that demands new action, approaches, and perspectives. The speakers the keynote and speakers of our 2018 uh, annual conference have been asked to analyze the situation as it stands at this time with all the implication that all of you probably have uh, been more than familiar with and uh, help us navigate the crisis. Our keynote lecture lecturer will be delivered by Dr. Riyad Mansour, who is the uh, ambassador and permanent observer to the uh, United Nations from the state of Palestine. Uh, Dr. Mansour's bio, I will uh, go over it a little in, in uh, summary, but it is in the uh, brochure that all of you probably have received, which I hope that uh, all of you will refer to rather than have me read it. <coughs> we will have a short 15-minute break after the keynote uh, lecture <coughs> and first before the first panel. Uh, following the first panel, we will have an hour to eat lunch, uh, mingle, buy books, at the front desk, and after that, at 1.45, we will convene for uh, panel two, which uh, will be followed by closing remarks. It's my distinct pleasure and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Riyad is a good friend for many decades of mine, as well as of the uh, Palestine Center, <clears throat> he is ambassador and permanent observer to the state of Palestine and uh, at the United Nations, as well as non-resident ambassador of the state of Palestine to Costa Rica and the Dominican Republic. His bio also, as I mentioned, is in the brochure. Uh, Dr. Mansour has been with the PLO mission at the United Nations actually since 1983 when he joined as deputy uh, permanent uh, ambassador. He does 
did have a short stint in the private sector, after which he returned to the uh, PLO mission. Dr. Mansour holds a PhD in counseling from the University of Akron, Ohio, and has published several articles about the Palestinian community in the United States. But before I have Dr. Mansour address you, I would like to go over some housekeeping uh, few matters. First, please silence your uh, cell phones. I have already done mine. Uh, and also in the question and answer session, please limit your question to a question rather than comments. Uh, for the sake of time, as well as in uh, courtesy, courtesy to others in the, uh, uh, in the audience. Uh, for our outline audience, uh, we welcome uh, their questions. A tweet it to the hashtag at Palestine Center, and you can follow us at the Twitter handle of uh, hashtag PALCenter18. Please join me in welcoming our uh, stellar keynote speaker, Dr. Riyad Mansour. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Subhi, for the introduction. And also, I want uh, to thank the Palestine Central, the Jerusalem Fund, for inviting me again to be with you and uh, to share some of our thoughts and ideas and uh, perhaps uh, to entertain some questions and remarks by those who want uh, to raise issues. I've been in this place, I think, two weeks ago. There was another conference uh, by, I think, the Immaculate Foundation. And, uh, it is always a delight to be in this place, and I want to congratulate you for all the good things that you do in uh, pursuit of justice for the Palestinian people. Also, I am delighted that uh, there are two individuals from uh, the Department of Public Information at the United Nations, the Palestine Unit, uh, Shaima and Yazan, and also, I am honored that we have seven young Palestinian journalists who are in uh, Washington and in New York for training, and they are with us here. I met with them in New York a few days ago, and I am sure that uh, they're learning as much as possible. Uh, the uh, industry of uh, journalism and media in the United States and the, in the United Nations, so that they can improve their skills in doing what they do in the best possible way. Learn, learn, learn. Ask questions all the time. Don't be afraid to express your opinions. Of course, I see many other friends here, some of them in the media, like Saeed, and other old friends. And I am delighted to be with you here. Now. Uh, you all know that when this current administration came into power, the first period, the first few months of that administration, they uh, articulated a position in which they were saying that they want to f solve this protracted conflict that lasted for too long, and President Trump even said, since he appointed his son-in-law to deal with the situation, he can resolve this complicated issue maximum in three months. So there was tremendous amount of hype and hope in the air. And in fact, in the few meetings that we had with President Trump and his team, whether in Washington, D.C., or in New York, you know, that the messages that were transmitted, uh, we can do it, we should do it, 
And this uh, uh, long-lasting, complicated issue need to be resolved and need to be resolved very quickly. So that, that was the atmosphere. Then, on December 6th of last year, a nuclear bomb was, you know, uh, unleashed or dropped on our heads. The title of it was that the United States of America will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel and will, remo will relocate its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Of course, this new unexpected earthquake in complete violation of international law and Security Council resolutions, especially resolution 476 and 478 and 2334, uh, and also in complete uh, radical departure from existing U.S. policy since 1947, uh, well, you know, caught us by surprise. Where did this come from? And the amazing thing that this huge gift that was given to Israel was given for free. Those who make the, uh, the art of the deal usually, if I give you something, you give me something in return. But I don't think that the principles of the art of the deal, I would give you something for free, and then we will see what you will give me in the future. Such deals, in my opinion, have nothing to do with the art of anything, not alone to say that the art of making deals. Then that step was followed by other steps, including on the 14th of May of 2018, the relocation of the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and then followed by uh, the refugees of the table, UNRWA, which is uh, a fantastic agency, by the admission of all those who are very familiar with, uh, with the multilateralism and the work at the United Nations. It is a model of success of an agency that looks after refugees until there is a just political solution to the conflict, they decided to deny that agency $300 million after they committed themselves the year before and in January that they will pay the money, and they selected not to do that. And the a few millions, I think maybe there are 30-some million dollars, that were given annually to uh, hospitals in East Jerusalem that take care of uh, the Palestinians. Also, that money was uh, uh, denied. That helps patients, including children. Also, that was denied. And then this process continued to unfold. For those who were waiting for the deal of deals, and you might still have to continue to wait, what we saw is the implementation of the deal of deals, and it is an awful deal, and it is a deal that will not move us closer to peace. It is moving us in the complete opposite direction. In spite of the fact that the US administration might say that their deal of deals, the objective of it is peace. Their action speaks louder than any articulation they might have. And the action is what they are doing is moving us away from peace and uh, moving us in the direction of uh, the uh, continuous tragedy as has been since the Nakba. And it is adding to the very complicated, explosive situation, tragic situation unfolding in the Middle East, as was described by Dr. Subhi, who came from Amman a few days ago. And the feelings that he transmitted to you about the, there's something, you know, unnatural unfolding in the Middle East, 
from what is happening in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, in Yemen, just to name only uh, a few very tragic situations that are that have been unfolding in the Middle East for the last, uh, uh, I don't know how many years. So that it is very unfortunate that the US administration is, is moving in that direction, which is not giving anyone uh, serious expectation that this uh, so-called uh, the deal of the century uh, will be released soon or will be addressing the issue in an effective way. And to add also to the complexity of the situation, you know that on the Israeli side, uh, the minister of war, Lieberman, uh, resigned. And it is very conceivable that the Israeli government might collapse and an early election might be scheduled so I don't think that the U.S. administration would be in the frame of mind of putting anything on the table when the Palestinian side is not accepting it and when the Israeli side might be busy with early election. So for those who are still waiting for that uh, huge bundle of things, uh, I guess, you know, you have to wait for a longer period of time and you might wait until the election of 220 and see what will happen after that election. So this is the situation that we are going through. Then what are we doing in order to sustain ourselves and to continue uh, the struggle for opening doors for meaningful process that would lead to the end of occupation the independence of our state with East Jerusalem as its capital, and therefore uh, accomplish the globally accepted uh, solution, which is a two-state solution. And, uh, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Antonio Guterres, articulated the position very accurately. He said that there is no plan B for the two-state solution. Now, of course, there are among us some who think the one-state solution is the, uh, the solution. I will come back to this point when we talk a bit about you know, the nationality law, uh, which was adopted recently by the Knesset in Israel. The only thing that I want to say now, and I will dwell on this issue more, is that if you look at what is happening to our Palestinian brothers and sisters who are citizens of the State of Israel, for the last 71 years, did not accomplish equality or uh, that they are the citizens of one state equal in citizenship. What they cultivated just recently, a nationality law in which the only a uh, group of people in Israel that are entitled to self-determination are the Jews, denying more than 25% that right, including 21% who are Palestinian Arabs, regardless of their religious affiliation, and about 5% who are Russians, but yet are not Jews. Most of them are Orthodox, and during the last few years, uh, um, you know, uh, revealed the fact that they are not Jews serving in the Israeli army and doing other things. They just fled the Soviet Union uh, during that time, uh, camouflaging that by pretending to be Jews, pretending to be other things. And then with, the, with time in Israel, they start mustering enough courage to say that they're not Jews, they are Orthodox. Some of them in the Israeli army wearing the cross around their necks and not being you know, afraid to show their identity and their affiliation. Those, all of them, uh, have, not, have no right to self-determination in uh, the state of Israel. So I said the, the first thing that for us to face this situation is the steadfastness of our people on the ground. The Palestinians today will never leave Palestine. 
we've done that in the past. We made mistake uh, of that nature, especially in 1948, in, when a large number of Palestinians left as refugees or were forced to leave as refugees. This time around, no matter what the Israeli occupation does to us, we are determined to stay in our land. And our number now between the sea and the river is almost equal to the Jews in the same area. And in fact, according to some statistics, we might be a bit uh, more than them. And with the years to come, the percentage in our favor will increase. So the first element in our strategy is the steadfastness on our uh, land. The second element in our strategy, and we are not succeeding yet in accomplishing it, is to put an end to this illogical division between the two parts of the state of Palestine. And all those who are acting on the basis of selfishness and not elevating themselves to the national requirement of what we need as we face all these challenges, including the so-called deal of deals of President Trump, one of the sharpest tools in our hand to be stronger in facing it is to have national unity. And therefore, to put an end to this division between Gaza and the West Bank need to be terminated as quickly as possible. And in this regard, we appreciate the effort of our Egyptian brothers who are helping us to put our house in order. That is the second tool that we need in order to be able to survive all of the challenges facing us and to contribute to the struggle to attain our national uh, rights, all of them, the right to self-determination, to the independence of our state, and the right of the refugees to return and compensation in accordance with Resolution 194. Now, another element is with the area where I work every day, in the international arena. And in the international arena, specifically at the United Nations, we, so far, we are maintaining a massive international support to our cause. And the details of our cause, if you analyze the 16 resolutions adopted annually, including one which was adopted yesterday, reaffirming our right to self-determination, which was adopted in the third committee, which, of course, that res resolution will come to the General Assembly for uh, another uh, round of voting on it. But in the third committee, it was adopted by 169 votes in favor and six votes against. The six, Israel, United States, Canada, and three, Micronesia, Marshall Island, Tuvulu, and a few number of states abstained. So, and when we go to the General Assembly, the tally will go up we might reach 170 something. And sometimes, you know, on this resolution, we cross the 180. So that there is almost a complete endorsement of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination. So, and also all the other aspects of our rights, including the applicability of the Fort Geneva Convention and all international humanitarian law to the occupied Palestinian territory, uh, the, uh, you know, the considering the settlement as illegal and therefore need to be stopped, to the old elements related to uh, a, a just, peaceful uh, settlement to the conflict, on the basis of international law and relevant UN resolutions that would eventually lead to the uh, end of occupation and the independence of the state of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital. So at the United Nations, in spite of all of the challenges that we are facing, I often say in Arabic, in Arabic and I'll try to translate it to English, in the Shaab al-Falastini laysa so in other words, I say that we are not orphans in the international arena. And those who support justice 
are so strong and at the United Nations that they are not abandoning the Palestinian people. Of course, the Israeli narrative, their leaders, oh, this is the automatic immoral majority, which is a racist articulation as if everyone in the United Nations are a bunch of idiots and a wizard by the name of representative of the Palestinian people is putting a spell in their minds that they can cast this massive amount of positive voting in favor of the Palestinian people. Nonsense. Often I say to them, you're telling me when the Europeans, 40 countries of them, vote unanimously in all 13 resolutions of political substance related to the question of Palestine, they're just a bunch of idiots that we, are, we were able to convince them to act in that manner. That doesn't make sense. So. So this is another important element in our struggle and steadfastness because it gives strength to our people in Gaza and in other places that we are not abandoned, we are not alone. The world is with us, the world is supporting us. So you know that this element also, although it is not the number one element, the number one element is the steadfastness and the struggle of our people in the ground. We are another element supporting it and they give us strength to behave in the best possible way as representative of such great people who are steadfasting on the ground as the Palestinian people. We always get inspired by the remarkable struggle and steadfastness of our people in the occupied territory. For example, when Israel two years ago, or almost two years ago, tried you know, to uh, divide Al-Aqsa Mosque, Al-Haram al-Sharif into two parts, uh, something remarkable happened. The Palestinian people in Jerusalem, Muslims, Christians, those who worship, those who do not worship, those who drink alcohol, those who do not drink alcohol, from all walks of life were united for 12 con continuous days, praying at the doors and the gates of Al-Aqsa Mosque, demanding that all the obstacles that Israel put, the wire gate, the smart uh, uh, gates, the dumb gates, uh, uh, almost the water gates, you know, whatever you want, <laughs> that were, you know, uh, 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 put, you know, at the gates of uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, and for 12 consecutive days, our people in a remarkable unity brought the Israeli occupation to its knees and they had to remove all these obstacles that they put in their path. For me, when I see such a remarkable lesson of steadfastness in a peaceful way, and all the violence comes from the Israeli army and the police against the civilians who are doing nothing but praying. Those who do not pray, they started praying. You find Christian and Muslim praying next to each other with such a remarkable, you know, uh, message that uh, was not only sent to the Israeli occupation, but to the whole world, and for them to be retreated is, is, is an inspiring, you know, lessons for all those who want to learn from it. It's for me, it's inspiring to fight harder for that just, for that just cause in the international arena. Then after that came the issue of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, in which they, they wanted to impose taxes on it. And for the first time in modern history, the church closed, went on strike for three days. And again, the Israeli occupation was forced to reverse its policy. So, then, and I said that, that that's the third component. Another compo component that is extremely important, a fourth one, in our general struggle is our brothers and sisters who are Israeli citizens, known as the Israeli Arabs, who succeeded in the last round of elections of putting a list, unified list, and were able to win 13 seats. They are the, th the second largest opposition party. And if we have elections soon, we will see how many seats they will acquire. It is conceivable that they might be the number one opposition party. Because of their strength 
And uh, the, the fact that the younger generation among them, they are not as afraid as maybe the older generation when Israel came into power. When Israel came into being in 47, 48, 49, 50, and they used to impose a military restriction that not a single Palestinian Israeli would be allowed to move from one town to another town and to stay overnight without a permit, so that the atmosphere that was created was an atmosphere of horror. And one can understand maybe the fear in the minds and hearts of our uh, grandfathers and our fathers of that uh, period of time. But with time, the, the following generations, the younger ones, who are becoming, you know, uh, are not afraid of the, the Israeli institutions. And they're fighting for their rights, you know, with the more uh, boldness and courage. Then things started to change, you know, and also the number from less than 200,000 to 1.8 million today uh, of Palestinian Arabs composed, you know, from the Israeli, you know, the population, things started changing. Now, of course, in the Israeli side, things started changing more into the right. And what was amazing that after 70 years from the Nakba, the Israeli establishment in the Knesset would go to the Knesset to establish a law. A law in which, in the first element of it, that, the, uh, that Israel is basically the national homeland of the Jews, and only the Jews are entitled to exercise self-determination. In the early stages of the establishment of Israel, they did not resort to such a law. They, in 1950, had a law of return. Any Jew anywhere would return to Israel, would acquire citizenship. In 1952, they had another law, they called it nationality law, but the nationality law of Israelis was not as we see, you know, 70 years later. So that the first item of this awful law, apartheid law, that discriminate between the citizens of a state on the basis whether the color of their skin, the case of South Africa, but in the case of Israel, on the basis of your religious affiliation. If you are a Jew, you are the only one entitled to exercise self-determination. The 25 other percent who are not Jews, they are not entitled for that right. The other element in that uh, in that uh, uh, piece of legislation in the Knesset, it's the law, which, by the way, it was adopted by 62 to 55, which means that there was a, a massive amount of opposition to it from within Israel, especially from those within Israel on the Jewish side who were trying to maintain Israel as a democratic state, meaning, yes, it is Jewish, but yet it is democratic, meaning that it allows even for secular Jews, you know, to, to be whatever they want to, whether they, uh, you know, practice their religion or not, but to try to, to keep it that way and also to, to stay within the domain of equality between all, uh, all citizens, regardless of their, you know, religious uh, affiliation. Another element of it is with regard to the Arabic language. For the first time in 70 some years, the Arabic language was demoted from being with Hebrew as the two uh, official languages of the State of Israel into Hebrew is the official language of the State of Israel and Arabic was demoted into an important language. And another element which is extremely important to us, all, us, all of us as Palestinians, which is element seven in the, or item seven, in the law in which it stipulates that Jewish communi communities, settlements in, uh, in the land of Israel, 
is very important, should be supported by the government, maintained, sustained, defended. Which exactly means the annexation of the West Bank in, to follow the annexation of Jerusalem, which took place in 67 and expanded further to uh, uh, expanded uh, Jerusalem, expanded East Jerusalem to be more specific, which took place in the early 1980s. Now, what is this with relation to us, the settlement? It is, no, it is nothing except annexation. And let me just read to you some of the positions, you know, articulated by Israeli leaders. That, that they were not, you know, afraid, you know, to, to, uh, to call it basically annexation. Prime Minister Netanyahu stated, and I quote, about the nationality law, this is the land of our, of our fathers. Uh, this is the reference to the West Bank and Gaza. This is our land. We are here to stay forever. There will be no uprooting of communities, of course settlements, in the land of Israel. Now, it, it, it's the land of Israel, meaning that the West Bank and Gaza is part of the land of Israel. What is really amazing, they have the tenacity and boldness today to legislate something like this under the light of the international community, not afraid of consequences because of the Trump administration in Washington that is shielding them and defending them, and because of some of the rightest trends in Europe under the banner of you know, populism and nationalism. Another leader, Naftali Bennett, Minister of Education. Today, meaning when this piece of legislation was adopted, the Israeli Knesset moved from heading toward establishing a Palestinian state to heading toward sovereignty in Judea and Samaria. The outpost regulations bill is the tip of the iceberg in applying sovereignty annexation. And there are other leaders who would repeat the same notion. What is international law says about annexation? Whether you want to go to the Charter of the UN, which is the mother of all, it is like the constitution of international law. A provision is there that it, it, it says there is no admissibility of the acquisition of land by force. Uh, Resolution 242, it reiterates this element that uh, the unacceptability of acquisition of land by force. Resolution 2334 of the Security Council stipulates that any change to the borders of the 4th of June of 1967, including East Jerusalem as occupied territory, is not acceptable by the international community unless the two parties, through negotiation, agree to any modifications to the borders. The Security Council Resolution 476 and 478, when Israel annexed and expanded and annexed more land, Beit Hanina, Shu'afat, uh, 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 all the way to Kufr Aqab and uh, to Samiramis and Kalandia, which expanded historic Jerusalem during the Jordanian time from approximately five or six kilometers square to about 78 uh, kilometers square. Uh, Security Council resolution says that any change to the status of Jerusalem, any illegal change of the status of Jerusalem is null and void and has no legal consequences. And they tied to it those who moved embassies at that time, and here I'm referring to Costa Rica and to uh, El Salvador. Resolution 478 asked those who moved their embassies to move them back to Tel Aviv in compliance with international law and Security Council uh, resolutions. So you see that this uh, 
nationality law, not only it deals with changing the character of Israel to deny 25% their right to self-determination, which is awful, which is illegal, which is apartheid, but it is also annexationist in nature of, uh, uh, of saying that the West Bank and Gaza, of course, in addition to Jerusalem, are all belong to uh, Israel, and they characterize it as part of the land of Israel, which is annexation. So this nationality law is not a threat against our brothers and sisters inside Israel alone, but it is a, a threat against all of us Palestinians, including those who live in the West Bank and uh, East Jerusalem. And it is ironic that in, in the modern history, and I think I said that last time I was here, last time I mean two weeks ago, for those who were not here, I said in modern history, three times apartheid system was put in place. The first time was put in place in this great country of the United States of America. When you used to go to Charleston, South Carolina, and if you go to the slave market, you would be able to buy and sell slaves. And then uh, after the Civil War, uh, those who are still thinking apartheid system managed to distort the results of, of uh, the Civil War by invoking the uh, segregation law and to discriminate on the basis of color. Separate but equal. You go to the court, you have two Bibles, Bible for Afro-Americans and Bible for uh, white Americans. They said equal but separate. Are they the same color? No, the Bibles, you know, I don't know. You, that's a good subject. Do some research. <laughs> the Bibles might, might be, you know, the same color. I don't know. And it took the United States of America almost 80 years to defeat that segregation law, which is a form of apartheid, and the massive, uh, remarkable civil rights movement, and all those who participated in it. I quote the tail end of it as a young kid uh, coming from Palestine, because my father, a steel worker in Ohio, and a refugee, managed by luck to acquire a green card after the war and came to the United States to take care of his family. And I'm proud that uh, he, uh, you know, kept fighting for his identity and nationality and went back to Palestine, retired there, and died there, and buried there. But yet, you know, he was a steel worker in Ohio and a refugee from Palestine and uh, produced a son who is the representative of the state of Palestine at the United Nations. So, may I have some water? <laughs> I don't know who will be sitting here, but... <laughs> so, this is uh, where we are. So it's annexation, as I said and the uh, violation of uh, international law. And going back, you know, to this first phase in history of legislating apartheid, we know that it required at the end, during the time of President uh, Johnson, to put laws in the books that you cannot ask an Afro-American to have a PhD in order to be able to fill the form to vote. Although we see some symptoms of that today, but nevertheless, it was simplified so that all who are citizens of the United States of America, not to be discriminated, some segment of them, because of the color of their skin and not to participate in the voting process. So that dark history of the United States of America was known and that phenomena was defeated because of the collective struggle of so many people in the United States of America to make America a better America than the way it was before. Then this awful system of apartheid was legislated again 
in South Africa. And they said that we, you, there are different systems for those who are Africans, blacks, Asians who are dark, Indians, and white. And of course, it became the infamous system known as the system of apartheid in South Africa. And humanity led by our brothers and sisters in South Africa and the people in the United States and everywhere at the United Nations played a remarkable role to defeat that awful system under the leadership of a brilliant leader by the name of Nelson Mandela. So <clears throat> this is the second time in history in which this awful system was tried and was defeated. Now for the third time in history, the Israeli Knesset legislate apartheid, segregation, and discrimination against people on the basis of their religious affiliation. And I believe that this time will be defeated as well. And it is our collective duty, including all of you sitting in this room and those who are watching, to do everything possible not to allow this new uh, phase of apartheid to succeed. I am completely confident that it will not succeed. It will be defeated. How long it will take, I don't know. But the sooner the better to defeat it because we do not need to have more than 100 years, almost 200 years or longer in the United States to defeat the awful system of slavery and segregation, and 50 years to defeat the system of apartheid in South Africa. In our case, it has to be defeated in shorter period of time. So this way, you know, I was told initially, your, uh, your, uh, your main speech is about the nationality law, but I don't think that I can speak about the nationality law without speaking about the first part of my presentation about the situation on the ground and how we Palestinians need to uh, sharpen our tools in order to survive, in order to, uh, to make our question relevant, and to eventually succeed in the attainment of our national rights, uh, all of them, including the right to self-determination, statehood, and the rights of the refugees. Our situation is difficult. I cannot kid you and say that it is not difficult, but we have the capability and the resiliency as Palestinians to try to minimize the harm and the suffering of our people if we manage to put our house in order, if we manage to uh, use all the tools available to us, including the legal tools, all peaceful, all civilized. And you know, I'm honored that in this complicated situation in the Middle East, as was described by uh, Dr. Subhi, and all of the you know, challenges that we are facing, the 134 countries at the United Nations, which constitute the group of 77, that's their name, it started with 77, they are 134. And there is 80% of humanity living in these 134 countries to elect the state of Palestine to be the chair of this group in negotiating 70% of, of, of the agenda of the United Nations related to good things uh, and advancements of humanity in so many different fields, while multilateralism is being under attack by those who are advocating isol isolationism and narrow nationalism to select the state of Palestine to undertake that uh, position is a great trust by the international community in our qualities and our uh, capability of leading humanity in all these issues from eradication of poverty to climate change to better education to better health system. So what it is a great honor for the state of Palestine to be able to do that in the year 2019. And we are preparing our team, training our team. We want to prove to those who still have doubts that we do not exist as a state, 
because we exist as a state, but our land is under occupation. We want to prove to them that we are a state, we walk like one, we talk like one, and we are responsible enough to lead humanity as a, you know, as a very responsible state in dealing with all these complicated issues. I thank you very much. Uh, thank you. That's exactly what uh, we anticipated uh, is true. Uh, we wanted the national law to be fleshed out by none other than the Palestinian representative at the United Nations who have actually uh, been involved uh, with uh, its uh, passage and uh, who followed it uh, with its passage in uh, by the Israeli Knesset from A to Z, and who would actually be tasked with dealing with its uh, consequences and uh, so on. Dr. Riyad will answer uh, some questions. Uh, I hope, as I mentioned before, that you will keep the questions to questions, not comments, and so on. Uh, there will be a mic that will be passed around? Yes, please. So we will uh, take from the right. Uh, well, here's one young lady. So her. What is your feelings on BDS? The mic, please. What are your feelings on BDS? I, I spoke last year in this room uh, with regard, I was asked something to that effect. We have no restrictions whatsoever for all groups and individuals in contributing to the struggle and advancement of the cause of Palestine in any way they feel is appropriate. It is not my job to tell you if you believe in what BDS does, that it is not my job to tell you you are doing a wrong thing or right thing. You decide it yourself. For me, I need to expand the base of support for the Palestinian people. It was Danny Dannon the ambassador of Israel, who decided to have two conferences during the last two years on bringing 1,000 uh, Jewish uh, American students to debate at the UN, abusing the facilities of the UN of how to combat uh, BDS. I said at that time, since he brought that subject, which is not on the agenda of the UN, bring it on. We organized two conferences at the UN for civil societies, and we might organize another one this coming year. And all organizations came, 400 plus. We did not put restrictions in anyone to express any opinion they want. They are responsible for the, their position. I am not responsible for the expression of any individual represent, representing an NGO from this orientation or that orientation. And maybe you will be delighted to know that more than 85% who were there and the discussion was related to BDS. Thank you. Uh, oh, I, I, forgot to, I forgot also to say, in our last session of our Palestine National Council of the PLO and the Central Council, and I'm a member of both, it was decided to support BDS by these two bodies of the Palestine Liberation Organization. Thank you. My name is Saeed Rekata. I'm the correspondent for Al Quds Daily. My question to you yesterday marked the 30th anniversary since the PLO recognized the State of Israel in the hope that it will be, uh, Israeli reciprocity will be forthcoming. And of course, it's been 25 years since Oslo. Last month, the Central Council, which you just mentioned, said that they recommended that they withdraw that recognition. Do you expect that this recognition will be withdrawn as promised in the, in the um, Central Council? Thank you. I believe that this is a decision by the Central Council and the uh, Palestine National Council before it, and it is the duty of these bodies to make sure that these uh, uh, resolutions are adopted. But what I wanted to say to you, Said, is yesterday was not the uh, day in which the 
the, uh, Palestine, uh, you know, recognized uh, Israel. Yesterday was a glorious day in our history when we in Algiers in 1988 announced the declaration of independence of the state of Palestine one year after, you know, the beginning of that remarkable historic first intifada in our history. So yesterday was uh, our independence day. I was, I was expecting from Dr. Subhi to say congratulations in, uh, retroactively, but it seems to me that he, did not, uh, he forgot. He has so many things in his mind. Not at all, but I will when Palestine will become independent. Uh, and and if we will move, uh, okay, from the left. Mike, please. What is the effect of some Arab rulers cooperating with the Zionists in Palestine on the future of Palestinian state? I give, for instance, Kabus a few days ago met with uh, uh, Netanyahu and uh, the leader of the Mossad met with Mohammed bin Salman. What is the effect of, of, the, of these rulers, please? Uh, you know, I, I was on television in Palestine about two and a half, three weeks ago when that visit of Netanyahu uh, took place to, uh, to Oman and also the uh, singing of the Israeli national anthem in the United Arab Emirates. <coughs> I said on television at that time that we have a contract among the Arab nations by the name of uh, the Arab Peace Initiative. That contract was adopted in uh, Beirut in 2002 and was reiterated in Saudi Arabia in the last uh, summit. The language of that contract states that there will not be normalization with Israel until it withdraw from all of the land that they occupied in 1967 that would allow for the Palestinian people to accomplish their national rights. And I said in television, what happened in Oman and United Arab Emirates is a violation of that contract. And it is our collective duty to make sure that those violator of that contract to be, to express our serious concern about these things. And I'm happy that two days ago there was a meeting, emergency meeting, as it related to the situation on uh, the Gaza Strip uh, by the Arab League at the level of uh, the, uh, you know, the representative. It was not a ministerial meeting. And in it, they said, they reiterated the position of the Arab League and they said, no normalization with any Arab country until the, uh, the end of the occupation to the land that was occupied by Israel in 1967. And I'm happy that that was reiterated. And I think that all of us need to be very, uh, you know, alert and to be on, uh, you know, to, to express our positions and concerns if these symptoms of normalization to take place before Israel to withdraw from the occupied land. Thank you, Dr. Mansour. And I just can't help but add something to that question, because that's one of the burning questions actually all over the Middle East and throughout history from the time that I was in college here in the early 60s till now. The fate of Palestine and the Palestinian questions will not be decided by Sultan Qaboos mm -hmm. or any other Arab ruler, ruler who pretends to speak for the Palestinians, it will in the final, in the end, be decided by the Palestinian people, by the young generations of Palestine, by the young people, as Dr. Mansour mentioned, who actually prayed at Al-Aqsa, Christians, Muslims, and whoever, and reversed what governments have done. Uh, I'm, I'm not here to give a speech, but I just couldn't help that. It will not be decided by Arab governments. It will be decided by the people in Palestine. 
Uh, the next question is the gentleman here from the middle. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I was fascinated by your mention of the fact that 5% of, or of the Israeli population, I think you said, yes. are Russian origin Orthodox Christians they serve in the IDF. And of course, there's a large, very large Russian contingent in Israel. Uh, how do you see the role of Russia in moving towards a uh, just uh, solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, along with other members of the Security Council and important actors such as Germany and Japan? Thank you. Well, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, it's part of my presentation when I was saying that our strategy as we move forward, I should have mentioned that uh, our approach is uh, after December 6, when uh, the U.S. administration took this uh, one-sided position of being 100 percent on uh, the Israeli side and therefore disqualified himself from being the, uh, the only broker to the peace process between us and the Israelis. We've articulated a position that was reflected by President Abbas when he came to the Security Council in February uh, 2018 and was adopted the essence of it in the PNC and the, P, uh, and the Central Council in which it states that we want a collective approach, global collective approach to address our issue and to be involved in it. And what is that collective approach? We want an international conference uh, to be uh, in, uh, under the United Nations you know, auspices, uh, to be, uh, uh, to, to include in it the five permanent members of the Security <coughs> Council, the five, not only the United States alone, but the five, meaning the United States, Russia, China, uh, UK, and uh, France. So this collective approach to allow for a process to unfold under the well-known terms of reference, which is international law and relevant uh, UN resolutions, to uh, engage in a process that would lead to the end of occupation, the independence of the state of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital, and therefore to bring to reality the two-state solution since there is global consensus on that uh, position. So in that connection, Russia is an important player. And China, we are trying uh, also very actively to get China to become an active player. And also, uh, uh, France is an active player, but also to give them even a bigger role because they organized during the last two years, three years, uh, two international conferences in Paris to try to bring larger number of countries to be involved in that issue. Why do we need uh, this collective approach? We believe that having a collective approach of that kind would increase the chances of success for finding you know, a solution between us and the Israelis. Because we tried the complete manipulation by the United States of America of this process almost from the beginning of Oslo, 25 years ago, and that took us from bad to worse. Settlements uh, increased tremendously. Our land is being <coughs> stolen continuously. The number of settlers swelled to close to 700,000. And now we face this situation of Jerusalem is off the table, refugees off the table, UNRWA off the table, and so on and so forth. So therefore, to have a collective approach that is more balanced, more objective, more fair, and guided by international law and relevant UN resolution would uh, give us a better chance of succeeding this time around while we failed in the past. In this connection, of course, Germany is an important player. Japan is an important player. So is Brazil, India, uh, South Africa. We want to bring to the table as many as possible of those who could contribute in a positive way 
to resolving this issue. Because our issue is a global issue. It is not only an issue to be dealt with between the Palestinians and the Israelis. So if we bring all those players to the table, they have enough experience and resources, not only to help us to reach a peace treaty, but also to help us to implement that peace treaty and to give it resources to stand on its feet. Sorry for being long, but I'm glad that you asked me that. That was part of my presentation, so it was now delivered to well, you late. I'm, I'm glad you understood that, Mansour. Uh, one more question uh, from one of the founders of the Jerusalem Fund. Make it two question him and this uh, young lady. Okay. I like gender that, balance. That makes two. <laughs> Thank you, George. Subhi. And welcome to the, to the fund here, the Ambassador. Thank you. Uh, I would like you to uh, express your opinion about this uh, famous achievement that happened this month. A Palestinian American woman is elected to the Cong US Congress. Uh, but I am a little bit concerned about <coughs> some of her views, and uh, at least now, uh, the Jewish community, the leaders of the Jewish community abandoned her. So what do you think uh, of her? Do you know her? Do, are you going to meet her? Uh, I'm just curious, uh, since we have a representative there. I, I talked to her over the phone. I, I am thrilled and honored that we have the first Palestinian-American woman elected to the Congress. That is history that is remarkable. <laughs> what I did... I went to Beit Ur el Foka and visited her grandmother and her family to express gratitude for them uh, giving us this uh, uh, fabulous gift of being the first Palestinian American woman to be in Congress. So, of course, and I'm, I'm speaking tomorrow at a banquet of uh, the Council of Palestinian Organizations. And a significant part of my speech as to in that would be related to uh, how all of us, not only Palestinian organization, but Palestinian and Arab American organization, to play a bigger role in influencing public opinion in this country. And of course, you know, you're doing something peaceful, respectable, uh, because this is how the political game is played in the United States. Irish Americans, they have large influence, including in Congress. Jewish Americans have the same. Uh, Italian Americans, Turkish Americans, but the Arab Americans, including the Palestinian Americans, are lagging behind. And Rashida Tlaib, perhaps, and also the young lady from uh, Minnesota, uh, who is a Muslim American from Somali you know, background, might be the first two uh, ladies, which is remarkable, that not men, women, yep. so that they are taking the torch to open the door for us to fight from the uh, chamber of the Congress for justice for the Palestinian people. That is remarkable. So I will say a few things tomorrow in my speech to that group uh, tomorrow night. I did not say much of it here today because you know I don't want to be redundant for some of you who might be also come to the event uh, tomorrow, I will uh, spare it you know, to tomorrow. Now, having said that, I think that we should be careful, all of us, not to pressure her to overload her message. Because some of us, and I think maybe one of your speakers that you might have later on, uh, sort of like pressured her so much to force her into articulating a position of one state, supporting one state solution. My advice to her, and I will say it to her because she's coming to New York, she should not get involved in issues of that nature. Whether we will have one state solution or two state solution, this is the business of the Palestinian people. She is in Congress. What she should say is whatever the Palestinians decide, I support. That is something for the Palestinians to articulate. The reason why I say that, because she doesn't need to bring more obstacles in her path because from the day she won, there are those who are assembling a force to defeat her next time in the election. It is our collective duty to do everything possible to make sure that she succeeds and she wins again 
and she wins again because the way the system is in this country, if you are a member of the House or the Senate, sitting there for one time and then two times and, th and three times, then you become stronger. It would become more difficult for those who are opposing you to unseat you. And once we have the first Palestinian American woman in Congress, we need to make her life so miserable and to push her into extreme position that nobody in Congress talk to her is stupid. We need to make her you know, to be able to uh, talk with 35 members of uh, the House or 40 or 50 and with the Senate so that, you know, that people can listen to her message, not, you know, to block her from, you know, uh, being effective and to relate the message and to fight on the basis of principles for us. And after all, she has to succeed in defending the interest of her constituency in, uh, in Detroit. And, you know, we should help her to do that. We should not be from, as we say in Arabic, من أول غزواته كسر عصاته. You know, you, we should be smart of how we do things in order really to be effective. So perhaps we will have another one. It's very unfortunate that Majar in California did not succeed, although he, the obstacles before him were much higher than, you know, the obstacles in the path of Rashida Tlaib. Such things like this, we should protect it uh, with all the power that we have. It is our collective duty to help her and not to be a burden on her. And we should not push for extreme positions. Those who want to push extreme position, the, the arena of such debate is among the Palestinian people, especially the Palestinian people in the occupied territory and in the refugee camps in the surrounding countries. Thank you. Darling. The last question is yes. just young lady. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you say a little bit more about how the original Palestinian um, recognition of Israel, the state of Israel, is affected by the ever-expanding borders of the country in view of international law? I'm not, I, can you clarify more? I'm not clear on your question. I mean, how how is the fact uh, that uh, uh, the um, Palestinian recognition of the state of Israel is in, in that form at that time has completely changed by expanding borders and how uh, that affects the, the recognition of the um, state of Israel. If you're referring to 1947, if that is your uh, uh, question, it is true that in 1947 when Resolution 181 was adopted, it, it, if you go to the archives of the UN and that resolution, that resolution was accompanied with maps to indicate the borders of the state, the, the, our state, and the border of the state for the other side, and also the borders of uh, the uh, International Administration for Jerusalem. That was in 1947. And if you review the Declaration of Independence of Israel and the Declaration of Independence of Palestine in 1988, you will see common language in some of the paragraphs. For example, it, is, it, it states that based on our natural and legal rights and based on Resolution 181, we declare the independence of our state. So that language, you would find it in both articulation, although one time I was attacked by a correspondent of the Jerusalem Post saying, where did this nonsense that uh, Riyad Mansour brought that there is a natural and legal rights of the Palestinian people to declare independence. No, there is no such things in legal instruments of natural right. Then I sent a message to him, you idiot, read the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel that says exactly this language. But if you refer to the other uh, recognition that uh, Saeed Arakat referred to, uh, in, in, I think in, it was in front of the lawn of the White House, and as a result of the, the uh, um, Oslo Declaration, uh, the, uh, the PLO recognized the state of Israel, and the Israeli government recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. Uh, maybe it was a mistake not to ask for the recognition of the state of Palestine, which we are trying to, rec to rectify 
uh, you throw, you know, what uh, Saeed raised on his question of what we've adopted in the Palestine National Council and the Central Council, which we should implement that uh, resolution. But we recognized Israel as a PLO, and the, uh, Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people. In this connection, since all of you live in the United States, I assume that maybe the great majority of you are U.S. citizens. Ask your elected officials, why are you more Israeli than the Israelis? The Israelis recognized the, you know, the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, and they deal with us as such. In the Congress, the PLO is a terrorist organization. Our office in Washington was closed because the president decided not to sign the waiver or the secretary of state. So then please ask them, if Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people, what is your problem? Why are you not recognizing the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people and deal with them as such and give them diplomatic status as the representative of the Palestinian people? It is mind-boggling that the United States of America is acting on this issue in complete uh, different than, you know, that uh, the action of the Israeli government. And I sense this is the last question. Yes. And Dr. Subhi, you will be doing the closing. I want to thank you again very much. Keep inviting me, you know, to this place. I love this place. Thank you very much, Dr. Mansour. We're almost back in time, just 10 minutes. Uh, we will have a 15-minute break for coffee and uh, so on. We will reconvene for panel one, uh, which will have four presentations and will be moderated by uh, the Jerusalem Fund Treasurer, Dr. Aid Mustafa. Uh, let's have the 15-minute break and please be back here. Thank you very much.